Welcome to Professionals and Coffee, a volunteer collective that boasts the professional profiles of poly relation practitioners through virtual coffee chats. My name is Carolina Salinas, and I'm founder and project manager of Professionals and Coffee. And today I'm so excited to have Austin Fisher, information coordinator of the city of Mississauga. And as our interviewer of Professionals and Coffee, we have Mandeep Singh, an international student from the PR program from Seneca College. Welcome to Professionals and Coffee, and I will now turn over the microphone. It is all yours, Mandeep. Thank you, Carolina. Uh, right, I'd like to introduce uh, Augustine. Augustine Fisher is a communication leader, passionate about storytelling, content creation, and public relation, while driving stakeholder engagement and enhancing brand reputation. He has worked across financial, energy, retail, logistic, and public sectors in Europe, Africa, and North America. Austin creates value, aligns business and communication strategies, and helps business leaders better communicate their perspectives internally and externally. Augustine is committed to give, giving back and, vol and volunteers as the Director of Communications for the Professional Independent Communications Group of the International Association of Business Communications Toronto, and leads the group newsletter letter, and social media channels. Augustine graduated with an MBA with a marketing focus and completed a graduate certificate in content strategy. Uh, I would like to start by asking Augustine, what interested you in the field of communications? Thank you, Mandeep. Um, and thank you, Carolina, for having me. It's, um, it's an opportunity for me to tell my story. <laughs> like, you know, I'm passionate about storytelling. So this is you know, a good platform for me to, to share my story and um, to help others that might be in the same shoes as me um, to navigate through um, the waters in the communications field, especially in a new country. So, um, I mean, what attracted me to the field of communication? Um, you know, I would say that, you know, communication chose me. I didn't choose communication, okay? Because straight out of university, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. So I just got out. I mean, like you notice, I studied applied economics as my first degree. So I got out of school, didn't really, you know, have an ambition or knew what I wanted to do. But I had a friend that was recruiting for a bank and it was an internship position. So they were recruiting for a corporate communications officer. And then I applied fresh out of school. It was internship. And when I applied to that role, I did my internship for six months and I was like blown away. I was like, wow, this is where I would love to be. And that's how I found myself in communication. Uh, right. So my next question is, Augustine, uh, <clears throat> did you face any challenges landing your first job as a corporate brand manager for First City Monument Bank Limited? I mean, like I said, um, because I had a friend that was a recruiter um, and then I got into the organization as an intern, it was easy to transit. So in six months, I was able to, to prove myself, so to speak. Um, I was passionate about what I did um, and I was a fast learner. So I learned, you know, how to navigate the waters. I mean, one of the things I did was managing relationships with journalists. And in six months, I was able to do that effectively that the organization, you know, thought and said it was best for them to retain me and because I loved what I did when they offered me you know a full-time position I gladly took it so it wasn't so much of a challenge because I got in through an internship. That's wonderful I'm, I'm, I mean it does show that you know uh, networking does help uh, you know to settle and transit through it uh, that's wonderful <laughs> right <clears throat> so uh, my next question is while you were working for Econ Petroleum as head of external communications. You started your master's degree in MBA from the from the UK with majors in marketing. I'd like to know how that helped you in communications. And education and marketing. I mean, like I always say, and this is very um, arguable. Um, some people will not agree. Communication is a part of marketing, right? So doing an MBA in you know focused in marketing was all encompassing, right? Um, and I learned earlier on in my career, you know, the, the impact that communication has on a business. So I made sure that I got an MBA in order to align business objectives and communication objectives, right? Um, when you work as a communicator, more often than not, everyone sees you as a cost center, right? They see you that you just spend money. But, you know, things are changing. You need to be able to add to the bottom line. You need to be able to contribute 
to the growth of the organization. And for you to be able to do that, you need to understand business and understand how communication can tie into business. And that's why I went in to get my MBA focused on marketing so I can align the objectives of communication and um, the business such that communication can add value to the organization. Now, it took me a while before I got that MBA because, I mean, first things first, I needed to understand the field of communication. I needed to understand if this was a career um, I wanted to, you know, push forward with, right? So it took me a while understanding the business. Now, like every other profession, you can learn on the job. Okay, so I, you know, did learn on the job. I quite quite a bit of skill and knowledge on the job, but I needed to back it up with an education and being able to understand the business side of things. And that's why I got the MBA at the time I did. Right. Uh, you know, uh, having said that, uh, I can relate what you're trying to say because uh, myself is, you know, from the management marketing background. So now I can relate much more, you know, how effective uh, that, uh, you know, having a degree in the communication field, yeah. a master's degree in, in management in the communication field mm -hmm. is helpful. I can yeah. oh, very well, uh, you know, relate to that. Good. Right. So uh, <clears throat> now you had nine years of experience in the field of communications before you went for formal education in this area. Right. Before, because before you had bachelor's and degree in applied economics. So how did the experience help you in the course? I mean, the truth of the matter is that when you're taking a master's in business administration, it's, it's unlike taking a master's in a specialized field, right? So if it was a master's in communication, um, it would have been different. If it was a master's in marketing, it would have been different. But this was a master's in business administration. Now, in my time, um, for you to go get an MBA, you need a prerequisite number of years working in the field right, um, before you are even admitted to do an MBA. Because an MBA is, you know, termed, you know, a, a program for business leaders, right? So it was beneficial for me to have worked a number of years before I went in to do my MBA. If I needed an education in communication or in marketing, I probably have done, you know, a master's in communication or a master's in marketing or even maybe a postgraduate certificate in content strategy, which I eventually did, uh, but I'll have done it earlier on in my career. But why I did an MBA was I was getting senior um, in the corporate ladder, right? I was becoming a business leader, much more than just a communications leader. I was becoming a business leader that was in the field of communication, um, if you know what I mean. So I needed to get a master's in business administration so I can have a full grounded understanding of business. So in as much as I was the head of external communication with Acom Petroleum at the time, I was also a management staff that needed to understand business. I needed to understand when, you know, the chief financial officer is discussing finance. I needed to understand when the chief human resources is talking about, you know, people management and things like that. So I needed to understand the full grasp of business. And that was why I went to do my MBA. So, of course, you know, it helped me a whole lot because, um, and I remember at the time I was saying to myself, oh, I am becoming senior in this organization, but I even want to become more senior in, you know, more organizations. So I reckon that, you know, getting an MBA helped me get in um, the job that I did with Maersk. Maersk was a, you know, Fortune 500 company headquarters in Denmark. Econ Petroleum was a Nigerian company, was a local company. But Maersk was a more global organization. Now, having an MBA in Europe um, also helped me get in that job. So I'll say it was beneficial um, to get an MBA. But of course, it is always best to get an MBA after you have some years of experience working in the field, it makes it easier for you to, you know, to pass through the school. Right. Yeah, uh, I can, uh, you know, relate to that because, uh, you know, even when I was uh, getting my master's, you know, there was this uh, uh, people did said that, uh, you know, they guided me that, you know, you should have a certain number of experience uh, in the in the management field before you go for the MBA, because that does help you to up your skills. Yeah, yeah. And help you through the school, actually, because in class, you'll be looking at real life business case studies, right? If you don't have any experience in business, it will be difficult for you to cope. So you should have some experience before you go for your MBA. However, straight from your first degree, you could go get a master's. So if I have a first degree in communications, for example, 
I could go straight up to get a, you know, a master's in communication. It deepens my communications knowledge, right? It makes me a specialist in communication. But if you want, you know, a more rounded business knowledge, then you should get an MBA. And my advice would be get some years in the field before you go get your MBA. Right. So just a follow up question to the previous question I had. Right. So uh, did you find any changes, similarities between what you learned through experience and what you were taught in the course? Of course, Mandeep, of course. Um, I mean, my experience would always be limited. <clears throat> right. And, and that's why education is critical and very important, because education opens you up to much more experiences that you can ever get. So education would expose you to experience of colleagues, experience of your lecturers, your teachers, and experience of tons of other people that have put it together in a book or in books, right? So education would definitely um, give you much more experience than you would ever get on the job. So my next question, Augustine, is uh, you've worked at different organizations in several countries. Do you think that the country's culture has any effect on the communication or how the communication is done? Um, I wouldn't say that the cultures of the countries have had an effect on communication per se. Like I like to say, communication is universal. Communication is the same across board. What differs in communication is the language, right? So in Canada, we speak English, but in India, well, we speak English in India, but in Denmark or in the Netherlands, we'll speak Dutch or we'll speak Danish, right? In France, we'll speak French, okay? So we would always communicate the same way across cultures. However, the language of communication will change, right? So if, you know, and I always say this, communication is very simple. You have a message, you have a channel, and then you have the receiver, okay? There would always be a message irrespective of the culture. There would always be a channel irrespective of the culture or the country. And there would always be a receiver irrespective of the culture or the country. Now, if the sender speaks in a particular language and the receiver understands another language, then there'll be a challenge, okay? So across the globe, communication is the same. It's universal. However, the language might differ. Maybe the channel would differ based on cultures, right? But the principles of communication remain the same across the globe. And that's the way I see it. So working in Europe, working in, you know, um, North America, working in Africa, for me, communication has been the same. However, in some parts of Africa where they speak Swahili or they speak Zulu or in Europe when I need to communicate in French or in Danish or in Dutch, I then change the language. However, the principles the strategy remains the same across the different regions I've worked in. Right, okay. Well, that's, uh, you know, something uh, new I got to learn that, uh, that, the, that the culture doesn't affect the communication at all. So uh, a follow-up question to your previous one, uh, to the previous question I asked. Uh, since you have broad experience working with different organizations internationally and in various sectors, did the work culture play any role in dictating how the communication is done? Yes. Now, for sectors, um, I wouldn't say work culture per se, but I would say that the target audience determines how you communicate, right? So when I was in the financial services, um, it was more B2C, business to consumers. When I was in the logistics and energy sectors, it was more B2B, business to business. Okay, and then when I'm now in the public sector, it's more government to public. Okay, so um, the audience determine how you communicate. Okay, the way you communicate to a retail or for a retail business is different from the way you communicate when you're communicating to a business, right? And, and those are the little nuances and intricacies in communicating across different sectors. The principles of communication never change. There would always be a sender, there would always be a channel, and there would always be a receiver. However, some receivers are on the streets, some receivers are in a high tower somewhere else, okay? 
And, and that's where the difference is. You would always communicate to somebody. Somebody must always receive your communication. However, this audience might be a mass audience. This audience might be a specialized audience. It might be a small audience. It might be a large audience. And those are the differences, really. In, in my mind, and of course, this is always open to further discussion. Some people might disagree with it. But I always say the principles of communication never change. It never changes. If you know how to communicate effectively, then you can communicate in any sector, in any country around the world. However, you need to understand the sector you're in. So if I used to communicate in financial services, it's because I understand financial services. If I want to communicate in the energy sector, I need to understand the energy sector. What is the business of the sector? What are the regulations of the sector? You know, what type of employees do we have in the sector? And what type of target audiences? Customers, are they, are they consumers or their businesses, right? Those are the things you need to learn to add up to the already effective communication skills you have for you to be effective in different sectors and different geographies around the, around the world. Right. So uh, you mean the strategy would change, but the communication would still be the same, depending upon you know what sector or uh, organization or pro probably country you are. Yes, Mandeep, and I've been accused to be um, very simplistic, but I don't see anything wrong with being simplistic, right? I remember I have a boss. He will say to me, "Austin, you think these matters or these issues are so simple? At the end of the day, my simplistic approaches." always come to, to be the one we go with because things are not as difficult as people say they are, okay, or as people try to paint it. The principles, once you have the principle, the strategy, it is always easy to execute. My next question would be, uh, <clears throat> would you like to tell us what you went through and how you found your first job in communications in Canada for RBC or say in Denmark for AP Moller? Being an immigrant, <laughs> and would you like to share some tips for uh, someone in this scenario? Mandy, do you really want to hear the story? <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> right. So um, I I'll start with, you know, working with mask. Um, so the first job I got with mask was in Nigeria, right? I was the head of communications for mask in Nigeria or rather for one of the subsidiaries of MESC in Nigeria. And the subsidiary was APM Terminals, right? Um, and, you know, APM Terminals managed the port in Nigeria. So it was a local job and that. So I reckon that I got promoted to becoming the head of communications for Africa. And that was how I got to start working out of Denmark. Okay. So what I, all I needed then was just to work permit, which was okay. Um, and then I moved in from Nigeria and I started working for Mesk in Denmark. So that wasn't much of a problem because it was within the same organization. It was like a promotion. You know, it was very easy. I already had the job. But when I decided to relocate to, to Canada, um, as against being, you know, someone that has a work permit, I have not become a permanent resident in a totally different country. Okay. Um, I resigned my job from Mesk to start afresh. Now, one of the things that I thought was beneficial for me was to get a Canadian education, okay? I needed to get a Canadian education such that it can, you know, in my mind at the time, I thought it was going to make up for me not having the Canadian experience, right? That a Canadian education that also had an internship with it uh, was going to help me get into the system. Now, remember, my first job started out as an intern, right? And then I became permanent. So my mindset was go get a Canadian education, um, do an internship, prove yourself, and then they would retain you. Unfortunately for me, um, I graduated into the pandemic, right? Um, and it became more difficult to get a job. I got an internship position, but it was very early on in the pandemic. Nobody was sure uh, what the future was. Um, and unfortunately, I did not get retained. And then I started looking for a job. Now, because there was a pandemic, it became more difficult. Um, people weren't sure what the future held. Okay, People weren't sure, businesses weren't sure 
Um, and there was some sort of hiring freeze. Now, it wasn't official. People didn't, you know, organizations didn't say, oh, we're not hiring. But, you know, people were being careful with hiring. People were being careful leaving their jobs, right? Um, a lot of people lost their jobs because of the pandemic. And those that had their jobs held on to it, okay? So there were not much of, you know, openings, so to speak. So it was a bit difficult getting um, a job after graduating from Humber College um, into the communications field. So, I mean, in as much as I would want to say, like a lot of people say that, uh, you know, when you bring in so much experience from outside Canada, it's more difficult. I would also say that for me, it was during the pandemic. So if I have to be a scientist at this point, I will say that the data is skewed. I can't totally say, oh, I didn't get a job immediately because, you know, they didn't like me or because I don't have a Canadian experience, right? Because there was a pandemic. Um, so look at this from that angle. Um, it, it becomes a little bit more difficult to say that the reason why I didn't get a job was because I didn't have a Canadian experience or, or X, Y, Z. So I can't totally say that. However, it was a difficult period in my life, okay? Um, thinking about somebody coming with, you know, over 15 years of experience, working for a Fortune 500 company like Musk, you know, coming to, you know, all my mindset was, everybody's just going to be running after me. Everybody would want to hire me. Uh, and I got tons and tons and tons of rejections, Mandeep. Um, I would apply for jobs. Um, I wouldn't even be shortlisted to do an interview, right? I mean, I remember applying for at least 10 jobs every day constantly for a period of about six months, right? Um, and then people started saying to me, why don't you get a job outside your field, right? Um, why don't you get a survival job, you know? And, and I thought to myself, why would I have so much experience? I've grown through the corporate ladder and then take on a survival job. At the point, I was thinking of going back home to say, I'd rather go back home than do a survival job, you know? But then again, I thought about it to say, hey, it wouldn't hurt, right, um, taking on a survival job. I'll just, you know, try to cherry pick the type of survival job that I get. So I got a job with, you know, RBC as a client advisor. And in my mind, that's a survival job. Some people wouldn't see it as such. But for me, it was a survival job, but I was grateful. I was working in an office. I had a computer and I had access to, you know, the job portal for the organization. So trust me, um, I applied to a communications job almost every other day while at RBC. Okay. Once I send in an application, I write a note to the hiring manager to say, this is me. I'm a client advisor, but this is my experience, you know. And, and to be honest, I got quite a bit of, you know, interviews, right? I got quite a bit of interviews. But from my thinking, um, it was a bit difficult. Now, this was unofficial, but it was a bit difficult to take somebody from an entry-level position as a client advisor and make the person a manager or a senior manager or a director because those were the roles I was applying for. I was applying for a manager role. I was applying for a director role and those kind of things. But it might have, you know, flustered the system in the sense that, you know, somebody came in as a client advisor and became a director in less than a year. Okay. So I totally understood that. Um, I bear no grudges. <laughs> you know, I, I totally understood that, you know, organizational structure, organizational culture and nuances uh, must be brought to book. So luckily, um, I applied for, you know, a job at the city of Mississauga and here I am. Okay. So I'm totally grateful for, for someone taking a chance on me. Um, and I know that now that I've got into a communications role, I would want always get a communications role because I now have the communications experience in Canada um, that would help me in future. Your story is fascinating, Augustine, and it shows you know how uh, resilience does pay off. And yeah. <laughs> So my next question is, uh, I would like to share some, it's a follow-up question. So would like to yeah. share some tips on successfully getting their communication field job 
for someone transitioning from a management marketing background? Number one, you need to know what you want, okay? You really need to know what you want. I knew that I want to get back into communication. That's where I've built my skill over the years. That's where I want to be. I could have built a career as, you know, a, a bank executive, right? I could have started up as a client advisor, become a banking advisor, maybe become a branch manager or an assistant branch manager, a branch manager, and built my career onward from there. Because my managers in the bank saw potentials in me, I took the certification to go to the next level in the banking sector. In as much as I was doing that, I was doing that so that I don't remain stagnant, uh, but I knew that I wanted to go back into communication. Okay? So, number one, the first thing you want to do is know what you really want. Okay? Number two is you need to apply for those jobs. If you don't apply for the job, you, you know, your chances of being called for an interview or your chances of getting those jobs are totally low, right? Now, take probability, right? So the probability of getting a job depends on the frequency of your application, right? So if I've applied 100 times and the probability is 10%, then maybe I'll get the job 10 times out of 100. But if I apply... 10 times and the probability is still 10%, maybe I'll get the job one half out of 10. Okay, you know what I'm saying? So always, always apply to the jobs you want to go to. Okay? Number three, you can't help it, but you need a network. You need a network of friends. You need a network of mentors. You need a network of senior colleagues to help you out. Now, the reason why you need this is Somebody might, you know, review your resume um, and add one or two points that might become beneficial, okay? Somebody might be sitting in a room where they say we're looking for a communications professional and the mentor says, oh, I know some good guy that I can recommend, okay? Um, and those kind of things. So you can't help it. You need a network of people. You know, it's a community of helpers, that's the way I see it. A community of helpers that helps you through, you know, the transition phase. You, because you can't do it on your own. You can't totally do it on your own. You need people to help you. So one, you need to know what you want. Two, you need to apply for those jobs. Three, you need to have a community helping you. And, and, and that community also includes attending job fairs, you know, attending webinars and seminars where you network with people, meet new people, and broaden your horizon or broaden your network or your probability basket, like I like to call it. So broaden the probability basket by meeting more people and then you'll definitely get the job. Right, that's interesting. I mean, networking, uh, uh, it's, it's so powerful. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Uh, now, last but not the least, any piece of advice for someone who is graduating in communications field to be equipped with? And does the city of Mississauga offer an internship program in the communications field? Okay, so I'll start with the internship. Um, I believe that the city of Mississauga offers some internship programs, um, but I'm not aware that they have any internship program for um, communication. Okay, so it might be a bit difficult for me to speak to it. However, Every job opportunity, including temporary, permanent, or internship, is posted on the job portal. So for anybody, you know, looking to work with the city of Mississauga, should go to the city of Mississauga's career portal and look for those opportunities because every opportunity will be posted there. Is that transparent? Okay. So that starts with that. Secondly, um, Graduating as a communications professional, wanting to work in communications, number one, you need to know your audience, right? You need to know the field that you want to work in. You need to know the tools required for you to work in that field. And three, you need to know the principles, okay? If you graduate as an engineer, mechanical engineer, for example, right, you, once you graduate out of school, you get on the field, you will be able to handle a machine, okay? Because you studied it from school. 
same thing with communication, right? Once you graduate as a communicator from a college or university, you should be able to get on the ground running from your day one, okay? Nobody will train you because they expect that you have that training. So the skill to communicate effectively, you must have it before you get on the field. Secondly, to be successful as a communicator, you must be able to manage stakeholders. So stakeholder management is essential and critical. Now, for some schools, they'll teach you that in school, in college or university, but for some others, they wouldn't. But you need to acquire those skills to be able to manage your stakeholders because communication would always be a support function. As a communicator, you would always be supporting somebody or something, okay? You're either supporting an executive, you're supporting a team, or you're supporting a product. A communicator will never be an island, okay? So if you do not know how to relate to stakeholders, then you're in big trouble. <laughs> you might have all the skill to be an effective communicator, but if you don't know how to talk to people, how to get people come over and buy them over, uh, that would be a great challenge for you. So you have, must have the skill and then you must be able to manage people um, to be an effective communicator. Right. Uh, thank you so much, Augustine, for your time, knowledge and advice. Uh, it has been a very informative session. Uh, that's everything on my end. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mandeep. I really had a great time chatting with you this morning. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Austin. Thank, thank you, Austin, for, for your guidance. And Mandeep, you did an excellent job. Congratulations. Uh, I, I enjoy a lot this coffee chat. Uh, are there any social media handles that you, Austin, and Mandeep would like to share with our audience? I mean, for me, you can um, hook me up on LinkedIn. Um, that's the best way to, to for us to you know, talk about professional stuff. So, you can, you know, search me up on LinkedIn. My LinkedIn is Augustine Fisher. So that's A-U-G-U-S-T-I-N-E. And the Fisher is F-I-S-C-H-E-R. On LinkedIn, connect with me and I'll be happy to speak with you if you need to. Okay, thank you. And uh, what about you, Mandeep? Yeah, so LinkedIn would work. So uh, yeah, I'll just uh, share the, the LinkedIn handle with you uh, through, uh, through WhatsApp. Okay. Uh, well, thank you, everyone, and see you on the next Professionals and Coffee Chat. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and to our social media channels, which are in the description below this video. And please join us to do your own virtual coffee chat like Mandeep just did today. Thank you and bye-bye.